Welcome to our online worship for Sunday, March 29th, 2020. We make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. Because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. We come before our Lord confessing our sins and seeking his forgiveness. And I invite you to take a moment to silently confess your sins to God. The Apostle Paul has called us to live life through the Spirit, not according to the flesh. We, we confess we have not put to death the things of the flesh and have sinned against you by what we have done and left undone, and we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return, O my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. The Lord will open the grave and put his spirit within his people, and they shall live. God in his mercy has given his son to die for you, and through his death brought life and immortality to light. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, in whom is life now and forever, through your Son's suffering and death, you have given us victory over all things, including sin, eternal death, and the power of the devil. Breathe into our bones and our souls your life-giving word, that we rejoice in your forgiveness and serve you and others in love and faithfulness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The epistle reading comes from Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If in fact the spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead, because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, 
He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. You know, I remember high school pep rallies back in Texas in the dark ages of the 1970s. And we would gather on those pep rally days in classes. The freshmen would sit as a group and the sophomores would sit as a group and the juniors and seniors would sit in a group. And then the cheerleaders would do their very best to pump us up. And of course, one of the cheers that they would use was, we've got spirit, yes we do, we've got spirit, how about you? And that raucous cry went back and forth in the gym from one group to the other. And it was a competition to see which class had the most spirit. Of course, it wasn't always a friendly competition because the seniors were trying to stick it to the freshmen and the freshmen were trying to tell the upperclassmen how cool they were. And some of the folks who were there, while they were sincerely uh, in pep rally mode, they really wanted to be there and really wanted to cheer on, you know, our Navasota Rattler football team. But then there were others who were simply going through the motions. They were just glad to get out of class. And so, you know, they did what they were required to do, uh, even though their, their heart really wasn't in the pep rally. But they were following the school rules so that they could get out of class. And regardless of the motivation, the goal of everyone was the same. It was to get the coveted spirit stick and to be recognized as the most spirit-filled class. In Romans chapter eight, Paul tells us that those who are in Christ Jesus have the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. But unlike high school students who are trying to uh, appease certain judges to show how spirited they were by their going through the motions of, of uh, school rules and pep rallies, Paul says that our spirit is a gift. It's not something that we earn through following the letter of the law. It's a blessed gift bestowed upon us by Jesus himself. We can't manufacture the Holy Spirit by going through motions. The Holy Spirit, once again, is a gift given to us through Jesus Christ. And that Spirit motivates us and moves us to show devotion and to offer up ourselves to the Lord in thanksgiving for what Jesus Christ has done by offering himself up to us as a sacrifice for sin. The more we try to impress God with our futile attempts at holiness and perfection based on our own flawed and imperfect actions, the more we demonstrate that we are bound and shackled to the spirit of sin and death. Trying to earn a passing grade from God by what we do, by trying to earn his favor in order to get into heaven, is pointless. As Paul tells us, we're in the flesh. 
And because we're in the flesh, we cannot please God. That sinful nature passed down to us from our first parents, from Adam and Eve, leads to death, not life. And that means that our natural relationship with God is not a friendly one. It is an adversarial one. You see, the devil wanted Adam and Eve to believe that they could become like God if they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, if they ate its fruit. That's the fruit of the tree that God said, don't eat. But Adam and Eve gave in to the devil's temptation and his lie. And instead of growing closer to God and being more like God, they found themselves to be less like God. In fact, that fruit separated them from God. They found that their will was at odds with God's will as they lived out the consequences of their sin. Is it any wonder then that Paul says that the, that the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God and incapable of submitting to God's good law? Paul is blunt when he says, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Let me use the current situation with the coronavirus as an analogy, as an illustration of my point. We individuals are doing what we can, everything humanly possible that we can to keep ourselves, our families, our neighbors, and our world healthy. You know, we are following CDC guidelines. We're, we're practicing social distancing. As I'm preaching this sermon, I'm preaching it to pretty much an empty church except for two people. You know, we're practicing social distancing. We're following the rules as individuals to wash our hands with soap and water for 20 seconds. We're following the rules that say you need to use hand sanitizer, especially if you touch publicly uh, available spaces. We're doing what we can to keep this virus from advancing and spreading. However, despite all of our efforts, people are still getting sick, right? The disease is still growing. All it takes is one sneeze, one uncovered cough, one untimely touch, one visit to a loved one without knowing that we're secretly carrying the virus. And then the infection spreads. It gets a foothold. We have good intentions, but despite our good intentions, the illness continues to advance. Despite our good intentions, we're not perfect in our behaviors and in our actions. And because we're not perfect, the virus infects the population. Isn't that the way sin works? <laughs> sin works just like coronavirus. Despite all of our attempts and our efforts, we can't eradicate sin by what we do, by our behavior, by our actions. Because for sin to be destroyed, we must not simply be good. We have to be perfect, which means we have to do what God says in the commandments all the time. We have to be perfect all the time. And that's impossible for us because we are flawed creatures. And that's why Paul says that the law is weakened by the flesh. You know, God's law is good, however even though the law is good, we're not. And therefore, the law can't accomplish righteousness in God's sight. It can, by doing it, we can't be found right in God's sight. You and I aren't free from the effects of the coronavirus in our bodies, but Jesus has, sent, has been sent into the flesh, into human flesh, to set us free from the bondage and death and condemnation brought about by sin. And that we can rejoice in. He was sent to battle the spiritual infection that every man, woman, and child deals with. And that infection has the potential to lead to eternal death and condemnation. But Jesus is the antidote. And he has come to give to you and to me and all who believe the antidote of his righteousness. And he himself takes upon our sin as he goes to the cross. And with that righteousness that he gives to you 
And to me, we have wholeness, wholeness and healing for our bodies, for our minds, for our spirits. And as we are made whole and enjoy a healthy relationship with God through Jesus, Jesus sends us his Holy Spirit. That spirit was first delivered to you and me in our baptism. That was the case for most of us who were baptized as children anyway. But that Holy Spirit continues to fill us and dwell within us as we find ourselves hearing the word preached and taught, as we find ourselves studying that word. That Holy Spirit is delivered to us as you and I eat bread and wine in Holy Communion because as we receive those earthly elements connected to Christ's word, you and I feed on his body and his blood because of our connection to Christ Jesus. The Holy Spirit dwells within us now and will remain with us always as we cling to him in faith. Like the students at the pep rally, we can cry out, we have the Spirit. Yes, we do. We have the Spirit. How about you? That's what we can say. We are fully alive. We are at peace with God. We have strength and power and righteousness because of the blessed gift of the Spirit whom Jesus has given to you and me. And because we have the Spirit, we don't live in the flesh any longer. That means in the morning when we wake up, the first thing that we, that we don't ask anymore, the first thought that we no longer have is, what can I do to gratify myself? With what can I fill my stomach or my mind or my bed or my bank account so that I'm satisfied and happy? No, those aren't our first thoughts anymore. Instead, our first thought, thoughts as those who have the Spirit is, what can I do to glorify and honor God? What can I do today to show Him how grateful I am for what He has done for me in Christ Jesus? I'm joined to Christ in His death and in His resurrection. And His Spirit dwells within me. And I'm excited and I'm happy because He is living in me. You know, the great thing about being filled with the Spirit is that even though if our bodies are struggling with limitations and with illnesses that might lead to death, like the, corona, uh, like the uh, coronavirus, we are still very much alive and well, spiritually speaking. Paul says in Romans 8, verse 10, but if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. The spirit has communicated Christ's holiness and righteousness to us through faith. Everything we do in our earthly bodies is to serve the Lord, no matter how insignificant they may seem to us. And so we glorify God. In these days, we glorify God as we spend time with our families, as we spend time with our children during this extended spring break, as we play with them and pray with them and try perhaps our hand at teaching uh, at home. Yes, we serve the Lord as the Spirit works in us, as we check on our families, if not in person, as we do so virtually. The Spirit lives in us and we serve and honor God as we listen to what the authorities tell us about social distancing and, and, and doing what we can to protect our neighbor from any spread of this terrible illness. Filled with the Holy Spirit, we live for God in our bodies, even though we may face self-quarantine and possible infection by the coronavirus. We know that even though our mortal bodies will one day die, we will rise again. The Holy Spirit given to us by Jesus is a guarantee that an even better life awaits us than the one we know now. Once again, listen to what Paul says in our text. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit who dwells in you. On the last day when Jesus returns, all who have died in faith will enjoy a glorious resurrection just like Jesus. Given today that we're worshiping remotely and online, we may not feel as connected to one another as we would be if we were in one local place, one physical location. However, our faith isn't 
dictated or dependent upon feelings or how many people are surrounding us as we worship. Our relationship with Jesus has been established through his death and his resurrection. And he has set us free from the law that leads to sin and death. He has given us his Holy Spirit, the spirit of life and peace. So in joy and thanksgiving to our Lord and Savior, we can say with boldness and with conviction, we have the Spirit. Yes, we do. We have the Spirit. How about you? Amen. The peace that surpasses all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. As we give to the Lord not only our prayers, but also our lives in the form of our time, talent, and treasure, we invite you to consider making a gift online on our website, or you can mail in the contribution if you so desire. Let us pray. The resurrection to eternal life has come to the world in Jesus Christ. Let us pray for the deliverance of all who belong to Christ by faith and for all for whom he died and rose again. O oh God, as you created everything out of nothing by your mighty word, so you have brought resurrection and eternal life to light by the mighty command of your son, Jesus. Receive our praise and thanks for your gift of eternal life. Help us to live as your resurrection people, bringing the might of your word to all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As our Lenten season soon transitions to Holy Week, help us continue to recognize our sin, our need for repentance, and our dependence upon our Savior. Help us learn from Paul's letter to the Romans to continually put to death those things of the flesh that lead us astray, that we be fed and led by your life-giving Spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. We lift up those who mourn and carry grief and sorrow in the loss of loved ones. Help us learn from our Savior, who at Lazarus' tomb spoke the word that death is not the last word of this life. Enable and equip us to be heralds of the hope that is ours and witness to Christ in the power of his resurrection. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the sake of your word by which you cause repentance and faith to issue from human hearts, Guide the leaders of nations and communities in our world to pursue, pursue ways of peace and tranquility among people, that your word be preached for the salvation of all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who are sick or infirm, disabled or troubled. Especially we lift up to you Cheney, the daughter-in-law of Candy Steinway and Lee Meyer as he recovers from surgery. And we also name those in our personal lives that we wish you would heal. Breathe your life-giving spirit into all in need that hope, comfort, and peace in you may be theirs. Remind us that our ultimate healing is in the resurrection of the dead and the life everlasting. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy. O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We pray together. Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.